Sweet 16, Arizona, Clemson. Clemson, a bit of a surprise. Nothing shocking, but I don't think too many people had them beating Baylor last round. Arizona's been taking care of business in pretty stylish fashion thus far. Uh, Dayton was an entertaining game, a little back and forth, close in the second half at points, but they pulled away nicely, and they blew out Long Beach State. We had recaps of those games over the first weekend for you. And Subi is our resident Arizona fan here on the channel for the month of March. We're bringing him back with Cart and I to uh, break down what we expect to be a pretty fun Sweet 16 game. Subi, this is the first video you and I are doing together. First off, it's an honor, my friend. I'm a fan of your work. Uh, let me say this. Are you feeling fortunate as someone who supports Arizona basketball that you get to face Clemson and not Baylor in this game? I suppose. And by the way, it's great to be back with you boys, but I suppose I'm feeling fortunate. I was hoping for Dayton over Nevada. And then I was hoping for Clemson over Baylor, but as an Arizona fan, and I've done, I did a preview and recap with cart as an Arizona fan, man, you just you, you like, you got this pit in your stomach, no matter what, like you, it's almost like that 50 cent video when he shouts out Floyd Mayweather. He's like, I, I dare you, or I challenge you to read one page of a Harry Potter book. Like I challenge you, Arizona to not screw this up. Like, let's see if you can not screw this up. I would love for that to happen. Greg, I should, I should have warned you because I have been on some Arizona videos with Subi. He explains it like that. I'll explain it straight up like this. This man is negative. He's negative. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, he is, woe is me. The whole team is going to catch the stomach flu and Clemson is going to run away with this game. I, and sometimes you got to talk them off the ledge a little bit. So just, I should have prefaced it with that. Uh, but Subi, this could not have played out any better, man. Like this, this is it. This is a great opportunity. You have a, on the horizon, a possible matchup. Not to look ahead, but I am going to look ahead because who's going to tell me not to look ahead? I can do what I want. Looking ahead, you have a possible chance to get Caleb Love revenge game to go to a Final Four, and the only thing that stands in your way is is Brad Brunell and Joe Girard. That's no, you're right. Great option. You're right, Kurt. It's a great it is. It's broken perfectly. When the bracket came out on Selection Sunday, you start thinking about the path and path, and you just say to yourself, no matter who the winner is, you should be able to take care of business through Salt Lake City, which they've done, and now you're in you're going to be playing a pseudo home game in Los Angeles. So if if you have the crowd behind you, you're a better team. Uh, there's a lot that's going to go into this, which I'm sure you'll dictate here in a little bit. But the opportunity is absolutely there. It's not lost on me, Cart, uh, which is also a contributing factor as to maybe why I'm still so negative and I have this pit in my stomach because it's like, it's like, how do you, please don't screw this up. Uh, it reminds me a little bit, last thing I'll say on it, it reminds me a little bit of the two Sweet 16 games they've played against Xavier in the past. One, they beat Xavier with Matt Stainbrook. And then the other, when they had Laurie Markkinen, blew like an eight-point lead with two and a half minutes left because Trayvon Blewett decided to go insane. So I'm sort of thinking of it like those Xavier matchups where, yeah, they're better. Uh, just please get it done. <laughs> Trayvon Blue was one of our favorite guards in the uh, um, last yeah. decade. Yeah, I remember we had a whole segment on our show back in the day when only like three people listened to our podcast on him. It was the best. Uh, anyways, okay, nice little history lesson there. I'm caught up to speed on Subi's negativity. That's fair. I respect yeah. that, by the way. A little bit of a like a you know trying to reverse jinx your team. I like that. Uh, I'm gonna come right into the negativity and ask some harsh questions to you. You mentioned. Uh, how much you've distrusted this program in general in spots like this, and you're trying to get over it. Two wins in March makes things feel a little fresh under Tommy Lloyd in this era after the way last season ended. Do you trust Tommy Lloyd in March, or are we still at the point where we're not sure about him? I would err on the side of, yes, trusting him, because I've always found it irrational and a little bit funny when people are saying that he's not a good March coach because of last season. And that was a catastrophe don't get me wrong but by the way we've seen what ryan langborg can do for northwestern in a first round game we've seen what the ivy league can do in a first round game for the second straight year i'm not saying it's excusable but sometimes that happens right so last year was bad but why are we completely washing away his first season where they went to the sweet 16 and they got beat by a team that i'm i'm not saying it was a bad loss they lost to a houston team uh and although arizona was ranked higher uh that Houston team was better, and I think they were tougher straight up. So I think his body of work thus far has actually been pretty solid uh, for a man who has been coaching now for 
approaching three years. I would err on the side of I trust Tommy Lloyd, uh, but this is going to be a huge matchup. And how are you going to do when and I think there's some crazy stat about Lloyd against the spread in the tournament. Um, these two wins he has under his belt. So we'll see what happens to get against Clemson. And there's some things that he's going to have to exploit. And there's some things that Clemson, I think, can take away from the Dayton game that can make it close. And when the screws tighten, how does that play out in the last like five, six minutes? Fair. Um, okay. I want to ask you about one thing from the Dayton game. I did listen to the recap and uh, I've been stewing on this for a couple of days since, cause I still can't fully process it. I thought Deron Holmes was awesome and we know Deron Holmes is awesome. So like that shouldn't shock me that much, but part of my belief going into that game of why Arizona would win was that I thought Balo could really make life hell on him. That didn't really happen. Now here comes a Clemson team that has a very versatile front court. PJ Hall will step out and shoot it. Shefflin even can hit some shots from three. Both of these guys are pretty resilient. They're, they're productive. They're kind of constants. Like, I don't think they really hide from anything. You're going to have to deal with them for 40 minutes. Uh, what do you expect with that matchup with Balo defensively? Like, is he, I assume he'll be on Shefflin with Kashad on PJ. And do you like that plan, that breakdown? What happens? This dovetails really nicely into what I was saying about Clemson potentially taking what worked for Dayton in that game. I'm terrified of, and look, I know you guys are making fun of me. I've just been terrified overall, but specifically the pick and roll. You had a stretch big and Deron Holmes and what Anthony Grant did really well in the second half was use him in the pick and roll and Umar Balo got sauteed. I love Umar Balo to death. He's been amazing, but he couldn't play the last seven, eight minutes of that ball game. They went small. Tommy Lloyd pulled Umar Balo off the court. And I actually think that speaks a little bit to the growth and maturation of Lloyd, not having this undying loyalty to his guy when oh. he's saying he's getting cooked right now. So he, uh, he pulls him off the floor. You, uh, sorry, uh, Carter, are you okay? <laughs> What's going on here? Sorry, sometimes the words undying loyalty to big men really hurts my <laughs> spot. My apologies. You scared me, man. Oh, sorry. I probably shouldn't be doing that. Keep cooking. <laughs> no, that was frightening. Um, but so, as was the pick and roll with Umar Balo on, on the court. But so, I think in this game, I wouldn't be surprised if Brad Brownell does something similar with P.J. Hall and maybe even Ian Shefflin. And I wouldn't be surprised if Tommy Lloyd is forced to go small yet again because Umar Balo has shown that at least in this spot, he can't defend that pick and roll. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Card, I'm glad your heart's okay. You made it through that moment? Yeah, I did make it through that moment. Um, the The one thing I'll say about it is, and the one thing that would scare me is that it's not just like the the like, kind of like the brute strength of P.J. Hall and uh, – and sorry, uh, PJ Hall and Shiflin, it's that the fact that they work so well together, like they always seem connected. Like I feel like a high low between them is just always just money in most cases, except for an ACC tournament against Boston College, which I still really can't explain what happened in that basketball game. But to me, the the Deron Holmes is such a unique matchup and he's he's an all-American level player. He's also better than PJ Hall. And I'm a PJ Hall truther. I love PJ Hall. Deron Holmes is better than him. And I, I think it's a little bit different. I feel a little bit, I feel a little more secure about Kashad Johnson being able to check him. And, you know, if, if Shiflin's going to knock down threes, I don't think that's always going to happen. I don't, I, I don't, I don't foresee that happening a lot. And to Lloyd's credit, I actually did like what he was able to do when he did go small. I think if I'm not mistaken, do we have KJ Lewis at the four for a little bit of that game? Yeah, KJ Lewis had some some minutes there as well. Yeah, like so I you know, I think he has the versatility on his bench. I even think that the the big other big man Crevis could be used. You know, he has the height, he's a little more foot speed than Balo. Um, so like, you know, Tommy Lloyd has some other tools um at his disposal. Um, and then that's just talking about the front court matchup. I think that, you know, uh Chase Hunter's been having uh, quite the tournament and run just out of nowhere. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's made Joe Girard somewhat an afterthought, but, you know, I, I do think that again, th there's an advantage for Arizona in that, in that spot. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be as afraid of PJ Hall as I am with Deron Holmes. I'm sorry to put that energy into the air now, but I'm just, I'm just saying Deron Holmes is a monster. 
Yeah. No, some of the key personnel you mentioned, it, it's very true. Ian Shefflin, I already know he's going to have me punching my couch with the amount of junkyard dog plays and offensive rebounds and extra opportunities he's going to create for Clemson. I remember watching them in January, especially against UNC. Ian Shefflin was everywhere, man. Like he is such, he's, he's the perfect guy I want on my college basketball team. Um, and I think also in terms of personnel from the guards, I don't know if anyone caught this, but Kylan Boswell jammed his finger. I'm almost 100% sure. And they've kept it real mum uh, on uh, about his finger, but I'm pretty sure he got hurt in that Dayton game. I want to know what, like inquiring minds want to know. I want to know how he's feeling entering this game. I hope he's all right. I've been, fo- I follow an Arizona walk-on on TikTok. I think his name's Willie. Um, and he's been posting a lot of videos with a lot of Arizona uh, players and there's no wrappings or anything on Colin Boswell's fingers or hands. If that means anything. I this like is- that. Thank you. This is why you come to Sleepers Media for top-notch analysis, injury reports. I follow an Arizona walk-on named Willie on TikTok. That's where we get all of our information. He makes some great content, by the way. Great content team. Incredible stuff. Uh, I was actually going to ask you about Boswell, and if there is an injury, it makes more sense here. I think he's been horrible in four of his last five games. Maybe that's a little harsh, and I'm willing to hear if you disagree. Uh, With that said... He has five points or less in four of his last five games. Five, two, four, 20 against Long Beach State with eight assists. What a stellar performance that was. Followed by two points and two assists in the dating game in only 18 minutes. Um, To me, he's been the key to this team throughout the season. Like when Arizona's been at their best, I think it's been when Boswell's been consistent and productive and a scoring threat. And then you go through the game logs of their losses this year. Like let's literally read his lines in all of them. He had six points against Purdue, 12 against FAU. That was the only loss of the season Arizona had when he was in double figures. Five against Stanford, zero against Washington State and Oregon State back-to-back. Six against Washington State, five USC. Like, it's just all these games. He just didn't score in any of them. I went to the Ken Palm page, by the way, for Kylan Boswell. Jumped out at me right away. One of the most similar players to this year's Kylan Boswell? None other than Joe Girard. Hmm. That's not a good thing for Kylan Boswell, I would say. Uh, Subi, what do you make of where Boswell is at right now? Welcome, Greg. Punch your ticket, man. You are at the Boswell theme park, baby. It is up and it is down, okay? But I've said this all year long. You're right. Here's the key. This is what I've been saying for the past like four months. If you can, if Kylan Boswell can give me eight to nine points, maybe a couple steals, a few assists, I will take anyone or I will take Arizona against anyone in the entire country. I will take Arizona to win that game with the exception of a UConn, a Houston and a Purdue. Like if Kylan gives me eight to nine, I will take Arizona over anyone except those three where I think you're going to need like the janitor and the equipment manager to bring their A game too. If you can get also some contribution from Jaden Bradley, I actually think they roll in a lot of games. And so what you saw in that Dayton game is, I don't know if, it, if roll was the right word, but Kylan was a no-show, but JB stepped up and they won by 10 to 12 points or so. If both of them are clicking, I think they can win easily against anyone, again, with the exception of those three. The question is, what Kyle and Boswell are we going to get, man? And that's the the terrifying part. And an added layer to that is, I don't know, I, I won't say Dayton was sleeping on Jaden Bradley, but after that performance, Jaden Bradley is no longer a secret. Like I guarantee you Brad Brownell and Clemson have him on their radar. I think Evan Mia said he's the best, statistically the best sixth man in the entire country, which is very nice for us. So if Kylan's not doesn't have it going, JB steps up. But uh, let me tell you, I would very much like some a, a fast start from Kylan Boswell. And I was shocked in that Long Beach game that he led the team or the game in points. And I think he may have even led the game in field goal attempts. I didn't expect that coming into Dayton, but then you just like, it's just such a precipitous fall that I'm just looking for some eight to nine points in an average game. Hmm. Hart, do you trust Kylan Boswell right now? Uh, No, I don't. I'm actually having a lot, the whole like roller coaster point guard thing. And then the loyalty to big man thing is like really punching me in the face right now and uncovering wounds that I'm trying to lick and heal. Um, but it, it's crazy to me. The craziest part to me about Boswell is like, I think that Duke's guards are amongst the most talented in the country. And this dude, Colin Boswell, walked into Cameron and dominated that game. Like, 
I saw that game and I was like, oh my God, I love this Arizona team. This is the Boswell they're getting with this Caleb Love and Kashad Johnson. I'm like, this is my title pick. I love Arizona. And then Colin Boswell did the roller coaster thing that you say. And by the way, this roller coaster, I don't know what amusement park you want to use. It's not like some little teapot short up, short down. It's like the dragster that goes all the way to the top and the bottom is really in the bottom. So if I, it should be easy though. And I don't mean to put it like this, but like there's, it should be somewhat comfortable, easy to him to kind of just be level, just be level, just make the right play, get some baskets where you should. You have guys like Caleb Love, other guys around you. There's really no pressure on him to, to like be this takeover guy. And it's a really good situation for him. So it's kind of frustrating that he does this. It's a, you, you hit the nail on the head and just in terms of the fan base, and how he's been received in his two years. Cart, you talk about the expectations, right? Like there may not be a better role to fill than uh, succeeding Kirk Creesa, who was like, I, I'm not going to lie. Everyone d- did not like Kirk Creesa. So you look at Kyle and Boswell and you're like, oh, he's going to be an improvement. And then sometimes you get Kirk Creesa-esque games from Kyle and Boswell. And that's what you got to avoid. His high is so much better than than Kerr's for sure. And I feel bad dragging Kirk Creesa into this after the season him and his Mountaineers had. But Kylan just needs to find some steadiness. I the, Here's the good news. I don't know where this came from, but in my head for the last two years, Kyle and Boswell has been Australian. And I just discovered he's not at all from Australia. He's actually oh. from Champaign, Illinois. Yeah, so so I, he actually it was between Arizona and Illinois for his recruitment. Card, are we allowed to be Illinois fans for a second? How did they let this kid get out of Champaign? So he's from Chicago, but he spent most of his time on the West Coast. He went to high school. He actually was get this, G. The backcourt in his high school was him and Jared McCain. Oh Jesus! Wow. And you want to know, you want to know who the backup guard was, who? or who started with them? Who? Donovan Dent. Wow. Yeah. Uh, for the record, is Ken Palm Page lists his hometown as Champaign, Illinois. So that's wild to me. Um, but anyways, I digress. I I must be confusing it with Tyrese Proctor. Maybe it's the inconsistent guards that I think are overrated element of this that made me think he was Australian. But here we are. I, I will flip it to this. Uh, we did the front court matchup in this game and why it's fascinating. I think this game is most interesting because Clemson's guards are playing really, really well right now on the flip side where Boswell is struggling in four of his last five. We're seeing Chase Hunter play the best basketball of his career in this NCAA tournament, back-to-back 20 point games. He had 20 and six assists against Baylor. He had 21 and six assists against New Mexico. Everyone came into that New Mexico game saying New Mexico's guards were going to destroy Hunter and Gerard. Didn't happen at all. Uh, And then against Baylor, again, a program known for their backcourts, Hunter and Gerard really held their own. Can Hunter – actually, you know what? I'm going to be bold on this. I think that Hunter and Gerard is the better backcourt right now with how these teams are playing coming into this game. I'm going to throw it to you first, Card. I'll let Subi stew on this. How crazy am I for saying that I think Clemson's guards have the advantage in this game? Uh, That's crazy because Caleb Love is that good. Counterpoint, Caleb Love, once out of every six games, is that bad. He's also the Pac-12 player of the year. And Caleb Love, despite what he does offensively, I think that he could have Hunter at hell on the defensive end if he draws that assignment. Yeah, so I hate this team. I'm obviously the pessimist, but I'm not going that far, Greg. I'm sorry. Uh, they are playing really well, though, the Clemson Clemson backcourt, especially Chase Hunter, which is I, I'm, I'm looking at those two games that Clemson has played. And I was like, oh, i got to deal with Chase Hunter now. Like, why can't I just focus in on P.J. Hall, which is I, who I know is a really good player. Some of these other guys. But Chase Hunter, I mean, hat tip to you for sure. But I still think the advantage goes to Arizona and and Kylan and also JB, like Jaden Bradley. Let's not forget about him. And also uh, Caleb Love. So here's what I will say, though. The offense for Arizona the last 10 games has not been elite, which is what we're used to seeing from Arizona. I would say three-fourths of the season. They haven't been awesome offensively. They've been solid, but not as a wagon like we were used to that, to seeing them. Their defense, though, has actually really picked it up. And I think they can really put pressure on the guards. I think they may be able to turn them over. Clemson does a good job of, of taking care of the rock. 
but I'm really leaning into this Arizona defense right now. And I think the guards have been playing pretty solid defense. Uh, and he, you saw that against Dayton and Clemson plays with a similar pace to Dayton. They want to play it slow, but Dayton turned the ball over pretty often in that first half. And that was a big contributor as to why Arizona was doing like windmill dunks to push the lead to 17. Uh, I think Clemson needs to be wary of that, but in terms of the back, the backcourt matchup, I'm still going to ride with my guys. I'm still going to ride with a guy who has, hit one of the greatest shots for one of the greatest programs in NCAA tournament history. I've, I've ridden them this entire season. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't give the edge to some damn Joe Girard and uh, chase Hunter over my guys. I'm sorry. Okay. Subi, I need you to look me in the eyes here. I, I'm staring you through your soul through this zoom call right now. Uh, blink three times. If you are being held hostage, when you answer this question, do you trust Caleb love? Yes. Yes. You mean that? You you're really looking me in the eyes and saying you in the NCAA tournament setting in a six game, six in a row, you trust Caleb Love. I trust Caleb Love in this Clemson game. All right. We're taking it one by one at this point. All right. We're all taking all right, it one. All right, Coach Subi. <laughs> taking it one at a time. Look, man, Caleb Love has been nothing but great to me. Ever ever since we got him over the, well, in the well, I mean, it, let's not act like in the last five games he hasn't gone one for 10 and one for 11, two for 11, excuse me. Do you not understand my standards? Like, my standards are not North Carolina standards, okay? I just want a Final Four appearance. I'm not even asking for a national title game or a, a, a championship. Like, that is my standard. And seeing a Pac-12 player of the year, you know, he's in the he's in with the likes of, like, Nick Johnson, who I hold in – great esteem okay like i think we need to recap and i want to make sure you guys understand what my standards are and when when we got caleb love in the off season i know what the what the rhetoric was it was like oh the the caleb love experience and i'll tell you what up until the pac-12 tournament or i'll say the the final regular season game in galen right against the usc it's really just been very good i think on the whole with caleb love postseason play arrives and he hasn't been amazing but he's done enough for me where i i cannot sit here and be like i'm gonna judge caleb love off these last four games i'm i just can't do it it's like it, greg it's like when you love a food right you love a food and you don't and like greg you might not have the same food as subi oh yeah. well like he's riding with he's riding with that meal and you just don't understand it what is that supposed to mean and maybe Subi has lower food standards than you. I definitely have lower standards. That's totally fine. Like Neither. what? Cool. What Caleb Love has done for me is more than enough. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I just wanted to check. I'm trying to check in on your friends. You know, that's what. I you know it's important times and Caleb Love. You know, this time of year things can. It's like seasonal depression, right? Caleb Love can kind of have seasonal inefficiencies. But isn't he great in the turn? Is are we like? Don't we feel good about tournament love? Well, I when do. We, when we tried to make this argument with Hubert and we said he's eight and zero against the spread, your flip was when he makes it. So I guess I'm not allowed to do that with Caleb Love. You you can. Are you doing that? I, look, he cost his team a national championship game. He got there, dude. Do you realize what I would do to get there? <laughs> yeah, but like, I think they're fortunate that didn't happen along the way. Is all I'm saying. It's look, it's great if you get there. That's great. It could happen. Uh, the, the last part of the Caleb Love conversation for me, we did a North Carolina preview with Riley Davis right before this, and uh, it all led up to this moment, this climax where I presented a conspiracy theory to him, and I'm going to present that same conspiracy theory to you. In the Big Ten tournament, uh, Card and I had watched Purdue and Illinois on the final week of the regular season in Champaign. Purdue went to Illinois and beat Illinois and essentially clinched the Big Ten title. They were ecstatic. Illinois had a lead for much of that game. They folded in the big moments. And Cart and I kind of left that game, looked at each other, and we were like, Illinois wants no part of Purdue. Deep down in their hearts, in their souls, if this team sees Purdue anywhere again, we're not going to trust them. That's two times. They blew their biggest moment. That leads me to the impending Caleb Love, North Carolina rematch. Because... I think this is a potential spot where both sides could be looking ahead, given who they're playing and uh, just the reality of how big that moment would be. A final four trip on the line 
with Caleb Love against R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott after all the offseason dialogue, after the divorce quotes from Baycott, et cetera. Um, I will say, you're right. No matter what I want to joke about with Caleb, he's been stellar. I, to me, it's a, a win-win for both sides. North Carolina got a lot better after his departure. But Caleb Love individually has been, I think, better than anyone could have imagined he would be in a new program. So that's all great when you're on opposite sides of the country and you don't have to go through each other in such a big spot. Did look at times for this game. Arizona plays the first game here. So to me, psychologically, this is where the conspiracy theory comes in. What happens in this game is rather meaningful to me because, look, I I don't think Caleb Love's dreading North Carolina. In fact, I think based on what we've seen from him in rivalry settings and against Duke, and when he went back to Cameron Indoor this year, This guy relishes being the villain. He relishes the big moment. He's never going to be afraid of a shot. He's just going to step up and be fearless. I can't say the same for Armando Baycott. And I think if we really, deep down in our souls, asked Armando Baycott and RJ Davis if they wanted to see Caleb Love with a trip to the Final Four on the line, they would be lying if they said yes. Arizona gets to play first here. I have a theory that if Arizona wins this game, North Carolina will lose their game because they don't want to see Caleb Love before the Final Four. Let let me ask you on the Arizona side. Do you think there's any chance Caleb Love could be looking ahead here to a rematch with his old program? For sure. Absolutely. And I don't think it's just a Caleb Love thing. I think it's just a college kid thing. We all love revenge at 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, right? When you feel like you've been jilted, when you feel like you've been... revenge now. That's that's what I'm saying, right? And we're supposed to be grown men, yeah. but you know, to to an, to an extent, to a degree. So yeah, like the emotions are absolutely running high, and this has been happening, you know, since Selection Sunday. And I think they've done a good job of trying to rein them in. And I know Tommy Lloyd knows about this as well. And you know what? Who actually could be uh, chirping in Caleb Love's ear to focus in the now ten toes deep? And this is actually another quote unquote revenge game. It wasn't an ugly or divorce or anything like that but steve robinson is an assistant coach on arizona staff where do you think tommy lloyd got steve robinson from he got him from north carolina yeah so steve robinson may just be saying look caleb i know both of us want to get there but steve robinson is a mature adult i trust him to rein him in a little bit and i think that's going to help as well also to that point fellas this is not the first time clemson has played caleb love right Outside of Duke, which Arizona played the back in November, nobody else has had a beat or a real study on Caleb Love. Clemson played him in the two years that North Carolina obviously played them. So I think combining, you know, Steve Robinson knowing that, hey, look, man, I get it. I know we both want to get Carolina, but we got to focus on a team that already has a beat on you, that has played you, and maybe has some tendencies uh, s- scouted out over the course of two years. We got to lock in. Uh, on this game but is the opportunity to look ahead absolutely i'm not naive there if we get to this game we will do a preview for it but i I just want to pulse check my theory with you would you lean where i'm at where caleb love would be ready and want this matchup and north carolina might be shaking a little bit to see him i don't think so uh i think that actually might add a little bit more juice for carolina if they see their brother who i think i do think they they still love Caleb Love and like Caleb Love at least has love for Carolina. Again, this is all speculation. He wrote like Tar Heel for, Tar Heel for life on his shoes when they went into Cameron earlier this year to Arizona. But I think if Carolina sees Arizona advance, they're like, look, now we have to hold up our end of the bargain. And who knows? Maybe Alabama won't just completely play like they've been playing the last two two games and instead play like the team they've been playing for the past month instead. So I don't know if I buy into that, Greg. I'll be honest with you. All right. All right, that to me, that Tar Heel for life thing was uh, that's Caleb being the elite villain that he is. If he sees North Carolina across from him, it's going to be some different words written on his shoes. I can promise you that. Car, what are you? You're you're an expert in villainy. Uh, what what do you read on this? A little bit too much. Like, um, what's the word? Like mutual respect going on for me. I need a little more hate sprinkled into this. Uh, I I get it. I I've, I've left companies before and I've wished them well. I wasn't actually wishing them well. <laughs> I was waiting for them to go under. 
Like let's let's not let's not act like Caleb Love doesn't want to cook R.J. Davis, especially you know I, he wants to cook R.J. Davis. Let's just say that. And I know R.J. wants to cook him back, and I know Armando wants to be him back. But with that said, to your point, Greg, UNC doesn't want to see Arizona, and Arizona doesn't want to see UNC. Like for the storyline, yes. But they want to play the worst team. I think Alabama's wow. worse. I think Clemson's worse. They much rather UNC much rather play Clemson with a chance to go to the Final Four than Arizona with a chance to go to the Final Four. And even on a different scale, because Alabama is good too. I'm sure as hell they rather play Arizona rather play Alabama than play UNC to go to the Final Four. Yeah. So it's a good reminder. Good reminder. Uh, Card, I have one last thing for you. I know you'll like this question. I think uh, Draymond Green, I believe, on his podcast recently said uh, half of basketball is just looking like a basketball player and uh, talked about some of the NBA draft guys that were taken ahead of him. He couldn't believe Nicholson was taken. just look at him. Right. Uh, with all due respect to the Clemson players here, are Kasha Johnson and Umar Balo looking across at PJ Hall and Shefflin and saying, there's no way I'm letting these two beat me. Yeah. I'm yeah that. I love Shefflin. I would take him on Michigan State in a second. He does have the face of a left guard, though. I just wanted to pulse check that because I think that could come here. We'll see. Uh, okay, that's everything I had for yeah, preview. I have I have one last thing. What do you got? I watched the Clemson Baylor game in full in its entirety. I've never seen a team more broke than Baylor was that game for a team that hasn't been broke all season. And I'm talking about broke in all regards. And there was a lot of open looks in that game. It wasn't Clemson locking down on defense either. Like, it, it was not that. It was Baylor missing open shots and Baylor shooting 50% from the free throw line. I think they were 16 for 28 in that game, something like that, something around those numbers. I don't know. 26, but yeah. You're probably- okay, so awful from the line. Yeah. I don't, think, I don't think Arizona's missing shots like Baylor did. That's all I'm saying. And there was a lot of open looks for Baylor. To summarize Clemson's run to this point in the tournament, New Mexico shot three for 23 from three, 65% from free throw in round one. Baylor goes six for 24 from three, 61% from free throw. So if that continues, they will certainly have a chance to continue winning games. Uh, And eh, look, Arizona's a very good basketball team, a very good shooting team. I wouldn't be stunned if Caleb by himself goes six for 24 from three. (laughs) Right? Like there's always a chance. Yeah, yeah, true. That's There's always true. a chance. I'm just saying. All right, uh, let's get to our predictions here. Presented by my bookie. My bookie is the presenting sponsor of all things Sleepers Media here in the month of March. They are our go-to sports book whenever Carter and I place bets. They've got everything you need. They've got futures, player props, odds boosts, expert picks, and predictions for all the games of March Madness. We have a special offer as well. Promo code Sleepers. You can get a deposit match bonus up to one thousand dollars as a first-time user. That's promo code Sleepers. The link is in the description. Of this video, the line that I am seeing right now at my bookie is Arizona minus seven and a half. Ken Palm has Arizona by five. So if you buy into that, there's a little two and a half point buffer. Subi will throw it to you. This is your team. What do you think the right side is? I would take Clemson with this number. I think it's going to be a tough game. I think it's, I mean, I, I don't. I'm not overlooking Clemson here. And I think the key for Clemson is to take care of the basketball. I alluded to this earlier in this preview, but I think they're going to do a much better job of holding on to the ball uh, than Dayton did. And that's going to prevent runouts. I think they're going to generate some extra opportunities because Ian Shefflin's going to drive me up a damn wall. Uh, but I think Arizona ends up winning this game. I'm going to side with Ken Palm by like five or six. Um, and I just think they're too, they're too athletic. For Clemson and I I'm, I'm ready to see Tommy Lloyd rely on that athleticism kind of goes to your question about Balo uh, and Keyshad looking across like I think it's all up and down the floor right like I think Pella Larson is super athletic and a wrench almost he does everything for this team I think even though I said you know Jaden Bradley is no longer a secret I expect Jaden Bradley to provide some good minutes off the bench I, pro- I expect KJ Lewis to provide good minutes off the bench and I'm hoping Mo Crevis does the same thing. So I'm going to take Arizona here uh, because they're just more athletic. They're going to find their stroke a little bit, hopefully shoot shoot better than nine combined threes. 
uh, which is what the previous two opponents did against Clemson. The only other thing I will say, by the way, uh, this is going to be a revenge game in the Elite Eight. If Arizona wins and dispatches Clemson, it's a revenge game for someone, and it's either Caleb Love and Steve Robinson against UNC, or it's Jaden Bradley against Alabama. We can't forget about that either, folks. Mm. What a revenge spot. Hmm. I love revenge. Carr, what's your side on the bet here? I think Arizona wins this game 84 to 69. A lot of comfortable blowouts from you predictions wise this week. Like you're expecting no more madness again? It's time for Cinderella to take her loose ass to the crib. Jesus. Carter's Carter's my keeper, man. I'm the one over here just terrified. He's the one with There's his There's nothing I could think of more than when Subi said I'm not overlooking Clemson than the opportunity to go next and overlook them. <laughs> you guys are just a really good, comfortable chemistry pairing here. Sometimes we pair people up on videos and you don't know how they're going to do together. Like, I got you guys together for one week, and all of a sudden Carter's R.J. Davis because Subi's Elliot Cadeau, and he replaced Caleb Love with a pass-first player, and now he's shining. Uh, I think Clemson's going to cover seven and a half. That's what I think is going to happen here. I think this is going to be a very close game. I think Arizona is absolutely the better team. Uh, but, you know, I love my conspiracy theories. And uh, if my conspiracy theory plays out the way the Purdue-Illinois conspiracy theory did, Purdue played early in the Big Ten semis. They lost. Illinois played late. They knew Purdue had lost. It freed them up knowing they didn't have to see them, and they made the Big Ten tournament run. Uh it's really there's no other reason than that i think this is a tough matchup for arizona but i'm going off pure superstition folks <laughs> uh we'll be back with a recap after this game thank you very much to Subi for all his help throughout march madness uh click subscribe and you can see all our videos for the rest of the tournament